Ghost Flight, this is 2-0. Give me a call when you're up. Three four, sir. One three, sir. Three four, sir. Three six, this is 2-0. What's the problem? Uh, one of my blues went back from more rounds. All uh, right. Give me a call. Three flight checklist complete. Roger. All lights working. All gauge is normal. Two zero. This is three six. I guess we're ready. Roger. Peahawk Tower, this is Blue Ghost 2-0 with a flight of five birds for taxi and takeoff. Zero nine or zero, break to the north. Roger, Blue Ghost flight. You're clear to taxi. Winds one, one zero at 12 knots. Give me a call. Roger. Ghost flight, we're clear to taxi. Roger. 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 Roger, Daddy, let's do it. Five, we're clear to left, right, and to the rear. Roger. All birds in place, lights up. Keha, Ghost flight at five, ready for takeoff. Little birdie in the tower, give me the word, we'll give it the power. Roger. Ghost flight's cleared for takeoff, zero nine or zero, break left. Winds one, one five at 14 knots. Please call clear, and have a good one. Roger, Keha, I copy, zero nine or zero, break left. One three, let's lead him out. One three, right. All clear, all gauge is normal. 96%, 98%, 99%, 96%, 94%. We're there. Turn on the air conditioner, will you? God, it's hot today. Roger that shit. Blue Ghost 3, this is Ghost 2-0, flight of 5 off Keha and route LZ Whiskey, over. Roger, 2-0. Contact Brass at 6, it's frequency Fox on entering AO. Negative red leg in this area, early contact Helix. He has two fast movers en route, just love to help. Copy. Roger, 3. I copy Brass Hat 6 and Helix. This one sounds like fun. Is Dusty on station? That's a negative. Roger, thanks much. Ghost flight, you copy? 1-3, that's all right. 2-4, copy. 3-4, copy. 1-3, got you 1-3, with all that going on, you guys might just have to watch. Roger that. If there's that much shit, I don't want to go smoking anyway. Now let's see what's on AFBN radio. we got 10 minutes. Okay. You got the aircraft. Maintain 2500 and 290 degrees. Take her over Tamkey and turn to 270. I got you. Keha, ghost flight is clear. See you later. Roger clear. I've been terribly alone. My name is Bob Drury. Eighteen years ago, I was better known as Blue Ghost 2-0 when I flew Cobra helicopter gunships, or snakes as they were called. I entered the United States Army on January 28, 1968, and landed in Nam in June of 1969. My statistics, 11 months in Chu Lai, 18 months in Chu Lai, 1,100 combat hours, the Bronze Star, 32 Air Medals, and the Distinguished Flying Cross. I killed 154 people. Tonight's story is mine, as I remember it. I've been terribly alone and forgotten in Manhattan. I'm going home. God, it's beautiful up here. Nice day. 3-6, give Red Leg another call. Make sure they're not firing into the area. 3-6, yeah, Roger. 2-0 negative Red Leg at this time. They are there, moving into the area. Roger. I've got it. You've got it. Brass Hat 6, this is Blue Ghost 2-0 en route with two snakes, two slicks, and a little bird. What's your situation? Roger, 2-0. Understand you've got snakes. Welcome. We can use you. I've got one of my units pinned down 400 meters due north of my position. Felix has been talking to them, but the bad guys are too close for his big stuff. You copy, 2-0? Yeah, that's a firm I copy. Who's my contact? Brass Hat 3 is the contact, and Helix is on frequency. Uh, Roger, 6. We'll see what we can do. Ghost Flight, this is 2-0-1-3. Set up orbit with 3-4 and 3-6 at 3,000 just south of Brass Hat. You copy? Uh, Roger, copy. Let's go 3-4 and 3-6. This one's for money. 3-4, Roger. 36, Brass Hat 3, this is Blue Ghost 2-0. What the hell are you doing out there? Roger, 2-0. I went for a walk in the park. 3, I got a team of snakes 60 sacks from your location. What's your situation? Well, shit. We were heading back to the perimeter when our lead squad got jumped. They're pinned down along the drive by fire from the tree line just to the east. The rest of us are bunched along the trail about 50 meters north. Uh, Roger, 3. I think I've got your squad in sight. Have them pop smoke. Roger, we'll pop also. Don't want any rockets on us. 
No, Roger, that's three. I copy one green and one yellow. T4, you copy one green, one yellow? Roger. You have a copy on the smoke. The bad guys are all on the first two lines of the east. Shoot them up, Lugos. Roger, that's three. Tell your guys to keep their heads down. T4, you copy? I copy. Helix, you copy? Roger, I copy. Go ahead, T0, shoot them up. My boys will be in the area in seven minutes. Clean up. Oh, Roger, Helix. T4, let's set up north, south, break right. Three pairs first round. Roger, T0. Uh, brass hat three, we're in. Adjust fire. Roger. Roger. Going hot. Roger. Cover with 40 mic mic well east of the tree line. Roger. T4, I'm in. I'm out. T4's in. T4's taking fire. Uh, Roger, taking fire. T4's out. Brass hat three, how you doing? Uh, Roger. You copy T4? Brass hat, any other friendlies in the area? Uh, Roger. Two zeros rolling in. We're hot. Roger. Two zeros in, six pair. Two four, Roger. Two zeros taking fire, 11 o'clock. Roger. Two fours in. Three four, Roger. Uh, Roger. Two zeros out. Three four, Roger. Roger. Three six, Roger. Time slows down when those little red and orange lights go by the canopy. Time slows down and all is very clear when you sit in the cockpit. You notice everything. A little crooked tree just to the left of your rockets, a, a slight puff of wind, the dull metallic clicking of a machine gun below, even the slow drift of the smoke grenade still lingering in your gun sight. You know that if someone would ask you any question, you could answer it and still continue on down that gun run. Anything can be accomplished in a second. But this is later. Much later. Years later, it seems, from the first time I killed. I'd been in country three weeks. Not much action. Maybe four or five flights. It's 6 a.m. It's calm this morning. Breakfast's finished. Clear skies. The cool smell of the South China Sea gives, gives no indication of the, the smothering heat to come later in the day. I've been assigned to fly as co-pilot for Jazz, Lieutenant William Jackson. I'm still a new guy, a Peter pilot, a Cherry, a co-pilot, so I pre-flight the aircraft. It's my job to check the airframe, check the rotors, check the three radios, check to make sure all is ready for the day's flying. Slowly I walk. Casually, I, I see myself as a tightrope walker, checking his equip, equipment before the crowd enters the tent. This is the only time of day that a new guy is in charge, so, so I take my time. Enjoy it. 6.30 a.m., pre-flight check for, complete. It's time for briefing. The briefing hut. The briefing hut is filled with the easy banter of the aircraft commanders, the banter of pros discussing past missions or, or last night's drinking exploits. The other Peter pilots, like myself, huddle around and talk about who we're flying with, which standby team we're on. The operations officer stands down front and starts explaining about some action taking place just east of Hep Duck, and that both fire teams will be on standby in support of the ground troops in the area. The room starts to buzz with, Hep Duck, wow, great, some action, and we get another shot at him. And do you remember that time you caught a whole squad of them in the open? I don't remember any of it. it. It's all new to me. I look over at Bill. Bill and I went to flight school together, and he's as new as I am, and looks just as scared. Bill's been assigned to fly as co-pilot for our wingman today. The first call for a mission comes quickly, and off we go. Jazz and I, Bill and his aircraft commander. Normal startup procedures, clearance from the tower, and off. Twelve minutes to hunt up. Chatter on the radio, chatter I, I can't understand. And then a man talking. Whispering into the mic. They're all around us. I can't pop smoke. Follow the trail. Up from the valley, a hooch. I'm inside the hooch. The rest of us are scattered. Shoot up the trail. There's hundreds of them. Jazz says, Roger. 
Roger. What the hell does he mean, Roger? What trail? What valley? What mountain? What hooch? For Christ's sakes, all I see on the ground is ground. And he says, Roger? Why the hell can't I see hundreds of them? All I see is green paddies, green mountains, and helicopters all over the sky. And he says, Roger. Then Jazz calls to our wingman and sets up the gun run. And our wingman says, uh, Roger. With that, I feel the aircraft lay over and level into the gun run. A gun run on a mountain I can't pick out, up a trail I can't see, and I hear, all right, I'm gonna drop six pair of rockets and then you cover me with a burst of 40 Mike Mike. Who's this man talking to? He wants me to shoot? And I say, Roger. The first three pair of rockets scream by the cockpit. Now I have the mountain now, but where's the trail? Where's the damn trail? Shit, there are good guys down there. What if I fuck up? Where's the goddamn trail? The last three pair of rockets are gone. This is fucking crazy. I'm supposed to shoot. And then I feel the gut wrench of the helicopter as it, as it pulls out of the gun run. My fingers haven't even gotten near the triggers. Then I hear the call from our wingman saying that he's pulling out. And then, good shooting, Blue Ghost. They're running everywhere. Keep it up. Further up the trail. One would just walk by me. Shoot around the hoops. And Jazz says, Roger. And then he asked me why I didn't shoot. Where? Where? All right, just shoot to the left of my rockets. You can't hurt anything there. And then Jazz calls to wing about more of the same, but further up the trail. And again, I feel the aircraft lay over and level into the run. This time I have the mountain. I watch the rockets and dum 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 dum. I watch my rounds exploding in a clearing just to the left of the rockets. There are people running. Oh Christ! The uniforms. They're friendlies. Oh my God! I watch one fall and then another, then another. They're dying. Oh shit, I shot the wrong place. They're dead. God, please make this a do-over. Bring back those rounds. I'll, I'll get it right. Good shooting, Bob. Hey, hey, look at him run. Jazz calls over the intercom. Good shooting. But, but, Jazz and I land at Kiha Airport. The crew chief comes out to see how our, how his bird survived and to help me check for bullet holes. Jazz walks back to the briefing hut. Post-flight check complete. No bullet holes. Crew chief gone. It's quiet. I sit on the skid and replay the scene. Those soldiers in the clearing falling as my rounds explode one after another after another. Not, not good guys after all, but, but bad guys. But I, but I couldn't tell the difference. I, I'd killed for the first time and, and I couldn't tell the difference. They were soldiers. And they were dead. And I, 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 I cried. Cried for the first time. For the last time I cried. My war had started. We 
flew three more missions that day, and for a week straight, sometimes four, five, even eight missions a day in support of the ground troops at Hep Duck. Later, I was to re return to Hep Duck many times and even be awarded a Distinguished Flying Cross for action in the area as an aircraft commander and a team leader. But it was that first day, after that first kill, as I sat on the skid with tears in my eyes, crying a cry that, that months later would turn to anger and years later turn to rage, rage at... Folks, you can talk all you want about the politics or the economics of war, but it don't mean nothing to me. War is not country. War is not for peace. To me, the combat soldier, war is personal. But I get ahead of myself. Each night after the action over Hep Duck, I join the other members of the gun team at the officers club and drink 25 cent shots of Chevis Regal. We drink and, and swap stories and brag about kills. Each day we'd fly and shoot and each night we'd drink and lie and, and drink some more just until the lies started to feel good and the pilot's swagger would return. And then one more drink and the swagger became a stagger, and back to the hooch and sleep, and up and fly into the club and drink into the hooch and sleep, and up and fly for a week. It could have been a, a day or a month, but this first time it was one week. And at the end of that first week, I loved it. I mean, the adrenaline was pumping. I, I had that pilot swagger down pat. I was that tightrope walker, and I was alive. Oh, others may die, but not me. I was a member of a fire team, and we were good. I wouldn't remember that first mission for many months, and, and I couldn't wait to get up and fly some more. <laughs> Scare me to death. Oh, I'd beaten fear. I could walk that wire, ride that roller coaster, jump off a cliff. Don't give me any easy missions. It's a waste of my time. I wouldn't remember that first mission for many years. And I was moving. Two months later, I was an aircraft commander. It was my ship. God, I was good. A month later, a team leader. I was Blue Ghost 2-0. I could fly all day and, and, sm and drink all night and smoke dope and, and watch the stars and see me and my ship fly among them forever. This was no nice home in the suburbs where I came from. No, no, no. This was real. This was war, and I loved it. This was when Johnny comes marching home again. This was the big time, the big top, with real gunpowder and a clown's cannons. This was John Wayne. And all those little red and orange and green lights coming my way weren't real. Not yet. Not when I was flying. I could shoot real rockets. And those tracers coming at me were, were just lights just special effects, just to make it more exciting. I'd fly and shoot my rockets, and the guys on the ground would thank me and want to buy me a bottle just for helping them out. I was Blue Ghost 2-0. Me. And the Army paid me and fed me and gave me medals. And the guys on the ground would thank me, and I could fly home at night and drink and smoke and swap stories, and get up the next morning and do it some more. I'll never be that same shy kid again. God, isn't life wonderful? Well, uh, noise you're here in the background is just me next to the airport. Yes, I do have a tape recorder, obviously. Except one thing, that uh, cart that you, did, you sent me had so much static and garbage on it, I don't know, I didn't know whether to throw it away or to eat it, because that's about all we get around here anyway. No, I, thank you, I really do appreciate it. Oh, now. I suppose I could say hi. <coughs> Excuse me. I suppose I could say hi to everybody. I don't, as I say, this, this is really strange. <laughs> Talk to people, I usually take, I can take time writing a letter. I didn't prepare anything, obviously. I've been here two months and it's gone by in a real hurry. It really has, and uh, it, my six, six months will be over pretty soon. And from there on, then it's all downhill. When I what really, a bunch of I really shit. That was the last tape I ever sent home. I had nothing to say to that family in that house on the lake, Milwaukee. That family. My family. 
What could I say that, that would make sense to, to my mother, my father, my brothers, my sister? They were from a different time, two months ago, a different era. And they had never met me I, because I was Blue Ghost 2-0. And I didn't care because I was Blue Ghost 2-0. Trouble was, you weren't always flying. Then I got two days off. I lived in a hooch or a hut overlooking the South China Sea, up on a bluff overlooking the sea, a sand beach below, and a coral reef extending out from the shore as if to catch the tropical fish as they swam by. It's the kind of place, it's the kind of place that if we had won, would now be a Hilton resort with a cable car reaching for the beach. The hooch is where we crashed. The hooch is the only place that I noticed a slight tremor developing in my hands, the ringing in my ears. There was never silence. There was never silence, but the hooch cut down some of the constant helicopter noises. I shared this hooch with three other warrant officers, among four other hooches with more warrants. Each hooch was equipped with a handcrafted psychedelic bar, a small refrigerator passed down from generation to generation, each generation being one year, and an electric skillet. It was as we sat in this handcrafted psychedelic bar, cooking Chef Boyardee skillet peaches, that we told each other how much we hated Nam, or swapped stories about good deals on camera equipment, and argue the merits of Tiak or Akai or some other oriental brand. We never talked about home, except, of course, how many days left until we returned to the world. And we never talked about flying. Now, this, this was a very exclusive club room with set rules of decorum, all based on not doing anything to destroy the knowledge that we were friends, friends who would never part, always keep in touch, friends who would not die, the best friends we'd ever have, friends who could be trusted the next day in the air, the kind of friends that you would die for just to get their respect, friends who would not die. I remember the rules of the club, the faces in the club room, postures of bodies. I remember that after a while, a, a face would leave it and not return, dead or gone home. And each time, a new face would appear. The meeting was continuous until late in my tour. I realized I didn't recognize any of the faces. Oh, the rules were still the same. I just didn't recognize the faces. I began to spend less and less time in that psychedelic bar. But you know, with all these memories, I can't remember one word, not one conversation, not even names are attached, just ever-changing faces. I can remember clearly radio conversations I've had with people I never met. But not one word, not even names, these lifelong friends of the club. But two days off. One day off was no sweat. I'd sleep late, <clears throat> go swimming, sleep some more, go to the evening briefing and get ready to fly the next day. But two days off, two days off was a, a different story altogether. Oh, the first day was still the same, except for the part where I'd get ready to fly the next day. Instead, I'd have time to do, to do, to do what? 
I spent 18 months in Nam. Each day I took a step further and further into war. Each day I added one more piece of armor to that vital cloak of the immortal. Each day I got better and better at what I did. Kill people. Oh, I saved our guys with our rockets. Uh, of course I saved them. I was in the area. They were on the radio. I tell them, of course I'll save you with my rockets. Why, once I even had to save myself. Oh, why not? I happened to be nearby. I was flying about 20 feet off the ground. Low. Slow, just, just looking around. When my co-pilot called out, he's got a gun! And I swung the bird around and I pointed it at this... this person who dared challenge me. I pointed the ship at him, and as he raised his rifle, choo, one rocket hit him in the chest, not 50 yards in front of me, and he disappeared. Magic, a puff of smoke, and the challenge was over. Yes, 18 months of watching farmers' huts blown up, dust-off ships return to graves' registrations, B-52 strikes wipe out entire hillsides, 18 months of heat and sweat and flying and ranch hands missions turning beautiful green mountains brown, 18 months of flying over that gorgeous countryside with waterfalls and canyons and wildlife and people in trouble and living and dying and, and living and... and dying. You know, I never could figure out why one person died in combat and another one lived? Why I went home and the next guy didn't? He almost always knew who was going to die, but never why. You knew that most of those who would die would take others with them. I guess that's the sad part. Others who you knew wouldn't get it got others killed. sadder still. Jim, he took his door gunner and his observer with him. He died on schedule, but I still wonder if those other two in the helicopter that day were on the same schedule or just happened to be flying with him that day. Oh, how do I know he died on schedule? His last 24 hours. Jim Tarrant had been in country many months and I was still a new guy. I only knew him as a cocky, cool scout pilot. He was one of the best. Oh, intense he was. I always seemed to be in charge on a mission. Well, one night, Bill and I were just chatting out in front of our hooch after dinner, and Jim walked up to us and started talking, talking about his family. Now, it was unusual enough to talk, for him to talk to us at all, both of us being new guys, but to talk about his family, his wife, his mom, his dad, so you could almost see him, his voice, his face, peaceful. All the intensity had drained out of his body. And then it hit me. Well, he'd gone back home. He'd left Nam. He'd, he'd lost his edge. Well, we talked, no, he talked for about an hour and then walked back to his hooch. Bill and I looked at each other and then blurted out, he's not going to make it. No way. The next day, I awoke to the news that Jim had been shot down in the AO. I didn't have to be told that he was dead. You see, Jim made a mistake. As he let down out of altitude with his door gunner and his observer on board, he, he didn't make any of the usual evasive maneuvers and was plucked out of the sky. All three on board were dead. The night before, did he know he was going to make a mistake? Did he make a mistake because he'd lost his edge? What part did Bill and I play in his death? 
Were we accomplices? Why didn't I say something to somebody to keep him from flying? From that day on, I was an accomplice in everyone's death, and I vowed that if I ever traveled back home the way Jim did that night, I'd never fly again. Who lives? Who dies? Some have to work harder at dying than Jim did. <laughs> Mo. Now, Mo was not exactly a bright kid, but he did have something special about him, though, uh, an air that traveled with him everywhere, a sense that cried out, I am doomed. Every time I flew with Mo, it was a struggle, not because of his flying. Well, he was a new guy and didn't have much to do, but every time I and others flew with him, there was always some problem. Two, three lost an engine and crashed. Both escaped. One time I had radio problems. But one night was special and still haunts me. Mo was my co pilot for a night recon mission with a searchlight ship. Now, the, the mission was the searchlight ship would shine its light at the target, and then I'd roll in firing my rockets using the searchlight as a guide. On our third target that night, I rolled in as usual and started punching off rockets. Choo, 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 and punching off more. Choo, choo. I, I felt that something was wrong, but I, I couldn't tell what it was. And then, and then my hand pulled back, gently pulled back. It just happened. My other arm pulled in power, and the aircraft leveled. I looked outside. To the side and overhead were trees. Shit, we were flying right down the center of a narrow valley, trees reaching for our rotors and something. It was my hands, but something had pulled us out of that dive. I had won the test, the test of wills, my will to live against Moe's rush to death. Two weeks later, with Mo as co-pilot for my wingman, we'd meet up one last time, one dreadful last time. Who lives? Who dies? Johnny. I, I didn't know Johnny very well. I did know that Johnny had a terrible fear of fire. Now, this fear is not unusual for pilots. I mean, if you have a fire on board at 5,000 feet, what the hell can you do? But Johnny's fear was worse than most. One night, Johnny lost his engine on takeoff from the hospital pad. He did a beautiful job of setting the bird down, gently setting it down. There was no damage. He just bent the skids a little bit. And then something strange happened. Johnny called over the intercom. Fire! Then he unbuckled his seatbelt. He jumped from the cockpit and ran away from the bird. He got about 15 feet from the helicopter when the still-turning rotor blade caught him in his helmet, killing him instantly. There was no fire, no danger, except in the head Johnny lost that night. The next night, when Johnny's friends and I gathered in the hooch to memorialize our brother, the pilot, <laughs> someone took out a joint and wrote Johnny on it with a pen. The irony of the fire on the match, the smoke, the glowing bud ember were our way of remembering him. I still do. You know, I think Johnny would have liked our little party. Oh, some do go home. I did. Slick did. <laughs> Slick was our resident chicken pilot. He never wanted to fly, and when he did, it was always for the milk runs. 
He wasn't resented for this because he always talked about how scared he was. He always talked about how his mission on this tour was to go home alive. Now, he wasn't one of us, the combat pilots, but he was liked. Slick always talked about home, his wife, his kid, fishing. Slick never did come to Nam, and Slick went home without a scratch. Slick was slick, and Slick went home. Another one who went home was Jazz. Now, Jazz was, was a woolly bear of a man, always smiling, usually drunk when he wasn't flying, and sometimes when he was. I flew many missions on his wing, and then I flew, also flew many missions as his co-pilot. Nothing ever seemed to bother the guy, and nothing, and nobody dared harm him. I mean, he could do everything wrong and still walk away. He could get that snake as close to upside down as possible and still pull out before crashing. He was the anointed pilot. He's the one I'd want covering my ass if I were in trouble. Sober, he was the best around. And drunk, <laughs> the luckiest. I tried to pattern my skills after his skills and avoid some of his daring. And we both went home. But it's the dead I remember. The dead whose names I took home with me. The dead whose deaths I can quote chapter and verse. Oh yes, and the wounded, laying there in a hospital bed, waiting to be shipped home, no arms, no legs. I smile, we talk. You're going home, lucky guy. Yeah, lucky. Half a face, no foot. You're going home. Going home. Going home. All good things must come to end. Eighteen months, December 1970. I had extended my year-long tour in Nam by six months so that I could get out of the army on an early out. I was to leave the army as soon as I got home. My eighteen months were over. December 1970. Eighteen months. My cloak complete. My armor intact. I don't feel a thing about anything. Eighteen months. Now, closing out a major portion of any story requires a punctuation, an exclamation point, something to tie the lessons, the plot, the characters all together. Eighteen months. I am scheduled to take a transport to Cameron Bay to leave the Nam tomorrow afternoon. It's night. My bags are packed. My exit interview complete. There's another fire team out on a mission. I'm leaving. I walk around the compound. I'm leaving. Then the call comes. A bird's been shot down in the AO. They need a team leader. I'm the only one available. The next thing I know, I'm pulling on my chicken plate. My hands are really shaking now. My God, I may get one more chance to fly, one more chance to die, one more rush of a fire mission, one more trip with that cool, calm radio voice I'd perfected, one more return to the briefing hut with that successful flight swagger, one more chance to die, an exclamation, a punctuation. slowly walk back to the hooch, strip off my chicken plate, lay back in the bunk and stare. The crew was rescued. 
the area secured. The call for my fire team was never made. I was done for the night. Done for the war. No punctuation, no exclamation, just, just done. The next morning, I walked around the compound wanting to say goodbye. People were busy. Oh, there was an occasional hand to shake, or, or a lucky guy, or, or a see you around. See you around, for Christ's sakes, where? Lucky? I didn't feel lucky. But what could they say? I was going and they were staying. How could I expect my friends who had months to go to understand that, that I didn't want to go? I wanted to stay. I wanted to be a, a part. I, I, I felt lonely and scared. More scared than I ever felt flying. I was alone. And scared to death. <laughs> scared to death of what was next. This was to be my going home, my celebration. And all I wanted to do was cry because I couldn't stay. But pilots don't cry. I wanted to get in that snake and fly, fly forever because then I didn't have to cry. Because I'd already cried once, and you only cry once in Nam. That afternoon, I got into a Jeep driven by a Spec 4 I didn't even know. And he drove me to the airstrip to wait for my flight to Cameron. I remember nothing of the flight to Cameron or the out-processing there. I, the next thing I remember, I, I'm sitting in a big jet with stewardesses. Hearing the engines wind up, feeling the brakes release, and, and then I remember, I, I, I remember knowing that the plane was going to crash on takeoff. I knew I wasn't going to get home. I knew it. I, I knew it. I, I wanted it to happen. I even saw it happen in my mind. The crash, the flames. It didn't hurt at all. And then a cheer from the back of the plane brought me out of my thoughts. And I cheered. We were off the ground. We were climbing through the clouds. We're going home. I am going home. Oh, my God. Twenty-two hours later, the pilot came over the speaker to tell us that if we looked out the left side of the aircraft, we could see the lights of Seattle below. The landing. One more chance not to get home. One more crash scene before my eyes. One more cheer, and I cheered, and I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Back to the world. I'm back. It's 4 a.m. I'm back. Steak dinner. Physical. No feelings. Just a blur. And it's 1.30 p.m., and I'm sitting in the SeaTac Airport cocktail lounge, waiting for that flight to take me home, home to that house on the lake, out of the army, on to new adventures! Two scotches under my belt. Home soon to my room. Mom's dinner. Another scotch. My room. 
the world. I board the plane. Do you know that the people that fly from Seattle to Milwaukee don't cheer as the plane leaves the ground? I miss those cheers already. Another scotch. I miss the cheers again when we land in Milwaukee. I get off the plane. There he is. <laughs> He's here. He's my dad. He's here. I'm out. No more war. I give him a huge hug in my mind before we even get close. We shake hands. Strange. You just missed Sarah by 15 minutes. Mom's got a good dinner on the table for you. Strange. Let's get your bags. Welcome home. 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 Less than 48 hours earlier, I was suited up to fly half the world away. And now I was home? Strange. There